Hello, my astrology friends. Welcome to the 2024 Astrology Marathon. And I'm Astrolada. Today, my guest is the beautiful, very much in love, astrologer Ksenia from Australia. Hello, Ksenia. Hello, David. Hello. David is Ksenia's partner. <laughs> Hi, Lara. Hi, Lara. It's Hi, lovely everybody. to be with you. <laughs> Thank I you for having me. Seeing you guys. Look at you. You two love doves. <laughs> That's you have a story and a half. <laughs> and of course, the topic we're talking today about is 2024 love and relationships. And who better to do than Ksenia? Can you quickly tell us your love story? <laughs> I would love to. Well, Dave, this is David Warner Matheson, everybody. And David and I met in 2021. David's an astro theologian. He's written 11 books on the stars, mythology, and psychology. And so we met in 2021 when we were on and did an interview together. And the fireworks just, you know, it was love at first sight for both of us and <laughs> and of course we have similar interests too which was a real bonus as well so it was very much a soulmate a destiny a stars aligning um, and you both have saturn venus difficult aspect in your horoscope and that's yes. people who have saturn venus at some point they start thinking i'm never gonna find love because saturn delays it gives you challenges in relationships more cruelty sometimes or just a lack of it but Ksenia and David are a perfect proof that love comes but a bit later but still it comes and it can be sweeping <laughs> that's it and miraculous when it does you know? so um yeah it was it really is miraculous I mean all the the gears of heaven that the... you're tracking in astrology really can be seen in this whole that's time. right yeah we I had um I mean if people have done the courses that I offer here at Astrolada the when will love come which looks at the timing of relationship and the other course that I have which is um the astrology of many marriages how to see whether you, whether you know you'll marry more than once um then you'll know there's a number of triggers that need to all align at once to um to bring about relationship we usually say three or more triggers happening at once will give the energy enough oomph to manifest something. Um, and when the day I found David was, um, there's like 11, um, 11 <laughs> triggers all happening at once. So it was quite, quite amazing, actually. Oh it was inescapable. And by the way, anyone who'd like to get those courses, I will put the link below and maybe even offer a package of some sort because Ksenia's best course is on love. Obviously, it was good that you were deprived of love for so long because Ksenia developed the best method, <laughs> <laughs> timing of finding love astrologically because she spent years alone and searching and asking and you know that's I'm sure that's why God did it <laughs> like totally agree totally agree I mean the reason that I dove deep into astrology in the first place was my marriage didn't work out my first marriage didn't work out and I was like but hang on I, I tried to do everything right why didn't this why didn't I get the happy you know relational life so um, even though I have sat in Venus it didn't mean that I didn't have a relationship but it wasn't the kind of magical stars aligning fireworks kind of kind of thing that um yeah has, <laughs> oh, has happened now so God um, said, you, know. oh, you have to develop a really good astrological practice first and deep because only pain pain was my trigger for astrology so <laughs> like, yeah. and it is for so many people it is for so many people when they're searching for answers and they come that's when they come to astrology for for the the answers that are so real and tangible i mean um we david and i uh like like i said have similar interests so we've got that beautiful connection too but we were saying before we started recording if i hadn't spent that time uh, i was on my own for roughly 12 years before i met david if i hadn't spent that time learning about astrology and ancient history and you know just filling my own cup through my own interest and what brought me joy it would never have led me to him in the first place. So yeah. we needed that time. We needed, you know, or I needed that time alone to be at one with myself, discover myself, and and as the they say, know thyself. That was so important. Mm -hmm. So 
yeah be yourself everybody who's looking out there for love and and when the stars align you'll be in the right place because you're being true to yourself giving you the space to start getting interested in some other topic through which you'll meet your partner <laughs> and I, I know yeah. that David, I've seen you work with uh, Graham Hancock and such big names as well conferences it's <laughs> yeah thanks. Well, it was a, it was a video of mine that Ksenia saw back in 2021 mm. and you had been told something or had a vision about Ezekiel and she was looking up Ezekiel on YouTube and found a video that I had done about the vision of Ezekiel and relating it to all the stars. Mm -hmm. And then you contacted me and said, would you like to come on my show? And I said, oh, yeah, I don't know. Astrology. <laughs> That's not <laughs> but really I'm an my... astro. What was it? Astro? The... Astro theology is what the... they sometimes call it. Uh, mm -hmm. The, the, the research that I do is about all the ancient myths around the world, the myths of ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, the stories in the Bible, the Norse myths, even in the Americas, the, the Maya, the myths of the Pacific, all India, all the Vedas, all those stories, I can show that they are based on specific constellations, a lot of times zodiac constellations, but not always. Oh my God, guys, you're a match made in heaven. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I've noticed, that's why I want to repeat this, we're talking in Vedic astrology, they say that Jupiter is your husband. And we in Western world is like, what, Jupiter? It makes so much sense because when you're aligned spiritually on the same belief system with your partner, like me and my husband as well, that's what's holding us. Believe me, nothing is as important. Yeah, the sparkles, the sex, whatever. If that's not there, it can't even start. But if you're not aligned in the same belief system, there's it, it will all the sparkles will fizz, fizzle and go away. And and you found each other <laughs> aligned on the same path. <laughs> you're so true. So true. Like we were just saying, we met at a time when the world was going bonkers with Mm -hmm. uh, certain restrictions and rules around things and we just felt we found that we were on the same page even though everyone around us was doing all sorts of crazy things we were actually on the same page as one another and that was really powerful from the beginning it also meant that we couldn't we, we just talked about this before we pressed record but we couldn't meet um because we were unlocked under lockdown we met in uh, uh september 2021 yeah, and you saw the video in August 2021 20, and just we didn't say it but maybe it's obvious you were in Australia I was in the <laughs> United States that's it so um yeah so w we were in lockdown in Australia and America wasn't letting in people who were had a certain medical status and I um <laughs> which was me and and so we couldn't meet until this year we met in in April this year so it's been a long time coming again, Sun <laughs> Venus. Saturn Venus. Sun Venus. You need to wait. Block it <laughs> first. All the world against you. Everyone on the opposite opinion. <laughs> I'll block it. Okay. That's right. But That's bond between stronger, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. If you've got, you know, if my seventh house lord is with Saturn, Saturn, Venus, and my seventh house lord are squared by Pluto. And like, I could just go on and on. <laughs> on with all the the difficulties that my chart has for relationship they're all debilitated in cancer but it, this is the, to me this is a beautiful miracle that I want to share with your viewers um Lara that because this is there's hope you know like miracles happen <laughs> no matter how trashed your Venus is or the seven house ruler yes it might be hard getting there that's how I've seen aspects it might be hard getting there but when you get there, especially with Saturn, Saturn is, you're going to be tested, but you're going to, once you find the love, in the face of all challenges and difficulties, you're going to hold on and you're not going to run away when things get tough. This is also mm -hmm. Saturn Venus. And for you, it started with things being tough <laughs> and you held on and everyone being against you and never, the world saying, you're never going to meet each other if you <laughs> don't do this or that. <laughs> and you That's right. Yeah. Because when, <laughs> well, we all know when it's the one or the, you know, when it's real, then, you know, you walk through fire for one another. <laughs> and yeah, so, so it's, it's wonderful. And yeah. Um, 
and then looking back it doesn't seem like it could have mm. ever gone any other way like it it feels like it was just the gears of heaven meant to be <laughs> turning and making it happen yeah wow, okay, so good bumps and that's, that's such a great intro into the topic that we're doing today love and relationships 2024 for yeah. all the 12 signs that i'm very excited to hear about and again Kisenia is the best relationship astrologer uh who would have also compassion for you <laughs> it's not just yes. giving you moral <laughs> advice from her high horse oh i've always been amazing at relationships and <laughs> you <laughs> that's right so, yeah and she's developed her own method and research and she triggered <laughs> she knew the 11 triggers when she I met. did so so when I and it, and when we when David and I first when I first found David um I didn't think to look at the astrology on that day because I didn't think anything was going like I just found this guy's YouTube video that's that's yeah. all that happened but then when I went back and researched I was like oh I had I knew all the triggers and like those 11 triggers I mentioned they're just from my progress chart and the transiting chart then there was all I haven't included in that the solar return chart, the perfection chart, and what was happening in my perfections as well. But it was just one thing after another. So very, very powerful. So I encourage everybody to do the course. <laughs> the course yeah, is a couple find of out courses. Yeah, so when this, this, okay, Senia is doing this gracious offer for with this uh video with free information and a really good offer for those two courses if you're interested and yes. i can now mute myself and let you take <laughs> over i guess yeah you want to stay here listen to what's happening for everyone for love <laughs> <laughs> i won't understand all of this. <laughs> you can david astrology very slowly but and i'm learning astro theology very slowly but it's, can I just say before we move on to what's happening in 2024 that it's been so empowering to learn your knowledge because um, it relates to what what we do and what we know. And having come out of a religious upbringing myself, you know, um, making sense of the the Bible, for example, and and other mythologies and what have you, and seeing where they fit, it's been really it's it's been really complementary to the astrological work I do, you know, because it's ancient knowledge that's being brought back to life, which is just like astrology, you know, we're doing that too. That's all yeah. the sacred texts, astronomy based and astrology yeah. based. That's and it's like nothing it's more important yeah. for me than that knowledge that David is researching because i'm i'm just not for me i want to know the whole cosmology i i i can't just know oh neptune in the fifth house means this or that i want to know where is it coming from and david you're yes. doing this for us <laughs> thank you for your service <laughs> <laughs> well thanks so much for having me on Lana. it's it, and i know that it's been just a blessing to ksenia to your relationship with oh the, same <laughs> goes both ways <laughs> thank you so really much David as well and yeah that's so so heartwarming guys I just thought yeah. it's wonderful <laughs> that we <laughs> do this intro together yeah. Yeah. yeah and love is magical I think and we, we talk often about how human beings are wired to find love it's it's natural and normal um you know there's times when you you want to just go at, either alone and be on your own but I think human beings do crave to be in connection in some way with other human beings. And so, yeah, it's been very, very good. But it's so hard. <laughs> it isn't it? <laughs> well, it's funny. Heard, I always hear that uh, soulmates, not twin flames, like true, the true soulmates, they usually meet once they raised children a bit later in life usually from different continents on the other ends of the world and through incredible circumstances that are beyond <laughs> like natural alignment, they get together. And I, I and you like the, exactly all the descriptions that I've read about twin flames, <laughs> like they find each other later when they no longer have like those 
too many responsibilities with families like so they can focus on the spiritual and growing together without distractions the family to around the world so that's you okay. know that although you and Matt would be the exception to that rule because you guys met yeah. before we had kids <laughs> we're both second marriages to each other <laughs> so, uh, sometimes met know, later in, the, in, life. in the yeah. Vedic system they, they really advise people not to get married until after 25 when Venus reaches its maturation because prior to the Venus maturing at 25, you don't really know, well, A, you're still discovering who you are as a grown-up in the world, but you don't really know what you want in a long-term partner. So, you know, great mm -hmm. thing to go out and date and have boyfriends and girlfriends, but they, they encourage you not to commit until after the age of 25 which I think is I wish was a principle that I'd known back then myself but anyway you live you learn <laughs> um, so we're gonna explore now what is coming up in the year ahead for love for people now I just want to say um, as I've already alluded to here you need to keep in mind that you need three triggers or more happening all at once to manifest relationship if that's something you're looking for and I'll just say we're not going to just be talking about you know when's love coming for single people here this is about people who are married and in a fabulous relationship or committed in a, in a fabulous relationship or people who are in a relationship and it sucks and they can't wait to get out um, or people who are happily single like you know we're going to be looking at the if the influences on our love lives this year regardless of our situation personally um, but I will just say you need to three triggers or more to bring about any particular effect at once like I like I described a moment ago um, and of course this is general because what you know you might be having a perfected seventh house year and that's going to mean something special for you that it won't be applying to the things that I'm talking about here uh, here for everyone so it's very general what I'm going to talk about here um, a, a, as a trigger for love. So, yeah, um, I just want to set that up right from the get-go so that we're all on the same page with things. Can I ask but... something? Like those three triggers, what? can you pull them from your sun sign, ascendant sign, and moon sign if they correspond and then like, ah, three triggers. That's right. That's right. That's right. You can use your sun, moon, and rising sign. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you really, I mean, I'm not going to do my whole courses here for everybody but you can look at things happening in your solar return chart things happening in your perfection chart um you can yeah we'll talk about a lot of the triggers but um the, the movement of your seventh house lord throughout the year is worth noting um the movement of uh your perfection lord as well what's it doing what aspects is it making to some key planets now and the outer planets which we're going to talk about they're big triggers when they are interacting with venus or interacting with your seventh house lord or interacting with your descendant that they will often bring something out relationally in your life and cause something to happen relationally in your life whether you're married single or otherwise so um they're the, they're some of the biggies that we're going to be exploring Wonderful. but first off I want to talk about the eclipses now. I'm hoping I can get this board in here a little bit. It might just help people. Do you to want see. me to stick around or let you let you guys <laughs> you can go? Stick around, but yeah, thank you, David. <laughs> thank you for. Okay, so, Lada, thanks. I'll let you guys. Later. Yeah, if you need me, just holler. Shout. We'll holler. Great okay. to see you, everyone. Great to Hi. see you, David. <laughs> you can come back at the end. <laughs> So um, I'm going to so mute myself. I'm going to mute myself, and I'm going to switch off my camera so I don't distract. And you can take over, and I'm just going to start charging my laptop. <laughs> okay, sure. So we've got a general uh, look here at the sky. Now, obviously, the planets are going to keep moving, so they're not going to stay like this for all of 2024. But one thing that is occurring is that if you are a Libra rising or an Aries rising. You're going to be having eclipses occurring on your relationship axis because the relationship axis, my friends, is the first house to the seventh house. The first house is you and the seventh house is everybody else, everyone else in your life, including relational partners. So um, 
this can apply if you are a Libra rising or an Aries rising, but it's also true if you're a um, Libra or Aries sun or a Libra or Aries moon person, there's going to be changes to your relational life in some way, especially if the eclipses fall, and I'll give you the, the degrees and so forth in just a second, but especially if the eclipses fall with your sun or moon um, or on your descendant or ascendant. So if you want to take some notes, I don't know if anyone is sort of noting things down on the calendar to pay attention to for love this year, um, but the 25th of March is the first eclipse that we, we're looking at next year, and that's occurring at five degrees of Libra about here. So if you've got anything there, including, I might add, your seventh house lord, the ruler of your seventh house, if it sits in your natal chart, at around five degrees of Libra, it's going to get triggered, which could potentially manifest something in relationship. And then we've that's a full moon eclipse. And then we've got the biggie for America, which is the new moon eclipse, the solar eclipse that's occurring on the 8th of April. And that's happening at 18 degrees here um, of Aries. So that's going to be visible right across um, a big portion of the, the United States and it's a full um, uh, new moon eclipse. So again, if you've got anything around 18 degrees of Aries or you might even you know be able to consider 18 degrees of Libra too um, for that one, that's going to be important. Then on the 2nd of December, a little later in 2024, there's another eclipse at this time at 9 degrees of Libra. This is a new moon eclipse as well. So new moon eclipse, as the name suggests, is when the sun and the moon are together in a new moon formation. So um, particularly potent will be nine degrees of Libra. You can give or take maybe two or three degrees either side of that. Um, to a lesser extent with the new moon eclipse, the sign opposite is important, but still might get a triggering, especially if your ascendant or descendant is in connection with the um, nine degrees of Libra um, new moon eclipse. And then the final one for 2024 is going to be on the 17th of October. And it's happening as a full moon eclipse at 24 degrees of Aries. So a full moon eclipse means that the, um, the, the moon will be here, but the sun will be over on this side. So um, anything at 24 degrees of Libra or Aries, particularly your ascendant or descendant, will be um, potentially bringing in relationship. And there's a few ways that eclipses activate relationship. Firstly, they can cause an existing relationship to suddenly end. Now, it all depends if, if Uranus was in, in any way involved with an aspect to these eclipses. Uranus will be here in Taurus all year. But in, in the case of eclipses in general, if Uranus is involved in an eclipse configuration on your on or with your ascendant or descendant, it will bring in a shocking, unexpected relational end. That's one way it can manifest. Um, but in this case, that's not likely to be the case. What's going to happen is if the relationship ends, you're going to sort of already sense it. You know, it'll be the relationship will be fractious, maybe argumentative. Um, sort of falling apart at the edges already. And this um, eclipses, if they fall on a, one of those degrees that I've, I've just said, will pretty much sound the death knell um, for the relationship if it's already in a bad way. But it can mean that a relationship can suddenly begin because of an eclipse as well. So for some people, they'll have a relationship end and begin all at once. For some people, they'll have um, uh, just an ending. For some people, they'll have somebody new come into their life and, you know, just turn their world around. So that's another way it can manifest with an eclipse. If you're in an existing relationship and the relationship is healthy and strong and loving, then an eclipse is actually likely to help that relationship grow deeper or to sort out any problems that haven't been addressed in that relationship. So don't be all like biting your nails if you're uh, in a committed relationship and there's going to be an eclipse on your moon or something. Um, really, it can bring about a deeper solidification or the chance to sort out some issues. So that's the eclipses for 2024 in a little brief nutshell. And then we have the influence of the outer planets. And I'm talking the outer planets in this case from Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Now, 
in Vedic astrology, when Saturn or Jupiter are either in, and let's give an example, if they are in the seventh house, like we'll make Jupiter here in the seventh house, if, if a, um, one of these planets in Vedic astrology, they only use the visible planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are in the seventh house or opposing the seventh house. Let's give another example. So in, in this case, Taurus, Jupiter would be opposing the seventh house. It's considered to be uh, one of the triggers that we look for in relationship for a relationship to come in. So the effect, it can, it can also affect existing relationships as well. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about how this effect might be manifesting in, in just a second. Um, like I said, Vedic astrology does not use Uranus, Neptune or Pluto, but I would suggest that the same method applies. If Uranus, Neptune or Pluto, as, as is the case here, Uranus is in the first house, it will alter and shift uh, or influence relationships in some way um, that's very Uranian, could be quite shocking, surprising, um, full of the unexpected and perhaps bring a relationship about that's got a big age difference or there's a long distance involved or um, it's on again, off again. These are influences of Uranus. We'll talk about that in a minute. So Uranus, Neptune or Pluto, I would say the same um, energy applies if it's transiting your first or seventh house it's making an aspect to the house opposite. So um, you could probably also consider if one of the outer planets from Jupiter to Pluto is making a conjunction to your seventh house Lord or to your natal Venus. This is conjunction only, I would suggest. Um, you might like to consider for blessing in, in relationship, maybe a trine as well. Um, but conjunction to your seventh house Lord, to your Venus, um, and even your natal moon placement. In fact, if Jupiter is opposing your natal moon placement, it's considered to be a big trigger for love coming in if that happens by transit as well. So, um, so, so for the more advanced among us, you could even consider your perfection lord of the year if there's any aspects by the, um, the outer planets to your perfection lord. It can sometimes trigger a relational experience. Also, it... I mean, it really depends if that perfection lord is ruling the the seventh house for committed partnership or the fifth house for love and dating and pleasure in that regard. So let's let's have a look at what the outer planets are doing. So we've got Jupiter here. Now I'm not sure if I'll yeah I might try and draw on the board what Jupiter's up to. Let's let's see. Jupiter is going to move through Taurus in the beginning of 2024 and he's moving from seven degrees let's do it down here it's about seven degrees of Taurus all the way to the end of Taurus that's Jupiter's momentum um he's going to move from seven degrees to 29 degrees of Taurus up until the 25th of May 2024 and then he's going to change signs and he's going to move into Gemini and he's going to move from zero degrees of Gemini right up to 21 degrees of Gemini and by the end of 2024 so we can see Jupiter is going to be covering quite a bit of ground and he's going to be moving across two different signs so anyone with the things I've talked about the ascendant lord uh, the ascendant sorry the perfection lord um, your seventh house lord your venus your ascendant or your descendant um, in those degrees that I've just given or opposite those degrees in the signs of Sagittarius and Scorpio will potentially have something manifest for them in relationship of a Jupiterian nature. So this could be um, that just Jupiter is expansive and increases things. So there could be an expansion of the potential for partnership or an expansion of your love relationship or an expansion of connection and union with somebody else depending on your situation that you're in, of course. Um, joy, joy comes with Jupiter. And so when this happens, Jupiter transits across, say, your natal Venus or whatever, um, then you, you, you just generally feel more joy with others, joy in connection, joy in a sense of belonging with someone else or sharing life with someone else in some way, whether that's a relationship. For some, it might be a friend. 
um for you know others you might meet somebody who feels like a soulmate whether they they are actually like you know a relational boyfriend girlfriend or um same sex relationship soulmate or whether it's just you know I've met the best friend I've ever had in my life and I just know we've been mates before you know it could be something like that but Jupiter brings joy in connection we also when Jupiter the planet of learning is triggering these things in this way we become um we're going to learn through relationship we're going to have some self-growth that occurs because of that connection that's brought us joy so these are the jupiter ways of manifesting relationship we might become very attracted to you know wealthy people famous people or spiritual people jupiter has connections to all those people groups so that can happen as well um there is also because Jupiter rules the signs of Pisces, which is faraway places, and Jupiter rules Sagittarius, which is all um, other cultures, we can potentially uh, be attracted to somebody far away from far away, or we might meet somebody foreign in our sphere that we're attracted to. Um, we might even meet someone when traveling overseas on a holiday and there's a, you know, a relationship or a joyful connection that develops from from that sort of thing um so it could be somebody from far away or a foreign culture to different to your own um feeling loving is so much easier when jupiter is transiting across our ascendant or our descendant particularly um i had jupiter transiting across my ascendant um uh, in pisces um during the year that david at the time when david and i met so that's an example of that feeling loving and because you're feeling happy and warm and loving you attract more happiness and warmth and love into your life what we give out is what we receive so we really have to watch you know our our attitude towards other people and um the the type of energy we're giving out to sort of mitigate attracting the people we don't want into our life so to speak um so relationships that happen under a Jupiter influence, I can vouch for this, they bring a great deal of happiness. They bring good fortune. Now, I have to say this, though. It is also possible that a Jupiter transit, particularly I would say a Jupiter transit across your descendant, this is more um, likely to happen when Jupiter is transiting the descendant, though it can happen when um, Jupiter is transiting the sign opposite your descendant as well. Um, it is possible to, that Jupiter in his transit can bring divorce. And I know that's going to be surprising to some people because, you know, you'd be like, well, isn't he the great benefic? Why would he bring divorce? It's because when Jupiter transits the house of relationship, you realize what it is you deserve and what you're worthy of. And if you are in a relationship that you don't, you feel like this is not don't stand you, you just can't stand anymore for anything less than your truth in relationship and that's why divorce can often come when jupiter moves uh, through the seventh house or aspects it by an opposition so we realize what it is we deserve and we see where we're not getting it and we're more optimistic because of jupiter's transit about making changes to our love lives and our relational lives that we may not be as optimistic about at other times when Jupiter isn't in that placement. So it's also, just to close up on the Jupiter topic, it's also going to be a very important time when Jupiter um, makes a connection with Uranus at 21 degrees of Taurus here. That is going to happen on the 21st of April. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots on um, the Astrolata channel about that conjunction when it occurs. But if you have anything significant at the 20, um, uh, 21st degree of Taurus, and even you could consider 21 degrees of Scorpio perhaps as well, then it's going to be a key time relationally for you, um, particularly if you're a woman, because as Lada mentioned when, in our intro when we were chatting, in the Vedic system, Jupiter is considered to represent a woman's man. So Jupiter is your man is the term that um, both Lada and my teacher refers to. Um, and so you might find you know, Jupiter is husband in, in Vedic astrology, so there might be some sudden um, finding a husband for some women. There might be, if you're married, there might be something, uh, maybe you're 
existing husband develops an interest in astrology perhaps or something Uranian, Uranus rules science and inventions and progress and the future. And so a conjunction of Jupiter with um, Uranus, if it's hitting something in your personal chart, can really impact relationships as well next year. Let's move along because there's a lot to cover about love next year, guys. Um, let's look at Saturn. Same thing, Saturn, if it's transiting the sign of or opposite your um, seventh house, it can do something with relationships in your life. So here's Saturn this year transiting through my rising sign, Pisces here. So we've got Saturn is um, moving from three degrees of Pisces in early January or in January, January the 1st, all the way through to the 19th degree about here of of Pisces so for Pisces Virgo axis people this is going to affect uh your if you've got ascendant or descendant on Pisces or Virgo this is going to affect you um it can actually be believe it or not a helpful year for love for Pisces Virgo people firstly Saturn is not debilitated in Pisces which is a big relief for a start um but he, what and I'll talk about what Saturn brings in a minute um, again, consider maybe your moon, although Saturn's transit to the moon is considered to be a very difficult time of recalibration and realignment. Um, often when you have a Saturn transit to the moon, it's known as Sadie Sati. And um, so for those of you experiencing that this year, and you will have been in this, this energy for perhaps the last two years since Saturn's been in Aquarius, because it's actually a seven year period where Saturn is transiting the house before the house of and the house after your natal moon placement. Saturn moving through here is going to redirect your life and change your life um, in some way. And it might feel heavy and it might feel hard. Um, be encouraged though um, when this time ends you will be you know wiser more mature um, more able to to take life by the horns so to speak um, once this transit is over and it happens to all of us so I don't want to scare anyone or upset anyone um, I believe I did a video some years ago on Sadie Sadie on the Astrolata channel if you want to try and search it and find out more about that transit but basically Saturn transiting the house of the descendant, descendant, even the sun or the seventh house lord or Venus can actually trigger um, relational things that are beneficial. Let's talk about that. Um, it can manifest the desire for more mature commitment in a relationship, in a partnership. You want to put that ring on the finger. You want to buy that house together. You want to make it official, um, you know, put all the, you know, I dotted I's and cross T's in their proper place for the relationship to be a committed one. So for many of uh, the viewers watching Astrolata, I mean, there's, people want all sorts of different things out of relationships. Some people just want fun and not in it for a, the long term, you know. But for Pisces Virgo people, making something official, making it concrete, making it, you know, signed on the dotted line, is a, um, a Saturn transit that might manifest this year. Hi, Lada, <laughs> you're back. I love that what you're saying. I just wanted to ask you, have you noticed, because I've seen at least four or five, because I don't work with clients now, but close people around me, when Saturn transited their moon, I'm talking women here, they mm -hmm. fell in love with very karmic relationships. Like usually mm -hmm. they'll be married already, some obstacle. <laughs> and they yeah. stayed in love for many, many years with those people. Maybe even had affairs or just were craving and desire. But I don't know why I've seen this. <laughs> like it, so it's true. Very strong love, but there is some obstacle difficulties. <laughs> so I'm just bringing this up. <laughs> I'm glad you did because that's exactly what happened to me. And that was years ago when Saturn transited through my moon sign Libra and I fell in love with um, somebody who this just like uh, unbelievable I felt that I was connected to him for many many years Lada and two weeks before David came into my he passed away he was a very unwell man and um, he passed away and I felt like um, he'd said through passing away like there was a letting go of the energy that had held on me since 
since that time when Saturn had transited my moon. So it's yeah. very, very true. It lo very holds true. a long time. Yeah, that's what I yeah. Saturn I, does that. And it's not a random relationship. You've been in many lives ago, but it's not usually, if it starts now, it's not usually the one that it, you know, it can, I don't know, there, there's some difficulty there. That's what it's I, coming. there's some working, Saturn's, some heavy stuff there. Yeah. Saturn's the Lord of Karma. So, you know, Saturn transit to the moon is going to bring a karmic relationship, you know, or, and I'll talk about this, but or also the descendant as well. You'll end up with karmic relationships that you may need to work out old problems or Saturn brings up karma in you about relationships. If you're in a, a healthy relationship, it mightn't be about you and the partner. It might be about your karma about relationship that needs some unraveling. So he's a pretty hard taskmaster, but there's method in his madness, I guess. Thank yeah. you for sharing that, Lada, because... Um, oh, thank you for doing this <laughs> great presentation. Yeah. I'm tuning out it's... again, so I don't interrupt. Okay. Not a problem. Well, my next point on my list of points about Saturn is our karmic dues <laughs> regarding love and partnership are paid when Saturn does his transit here. So, you know, that's, we've just explained how that's obvious. Um, what is happening when Saturn is making a transit to key relational planets or points in the chart is that we're defining and restructuring our needs the needs of the heart now whether we're in a relationship or not we're redefining what it is we need and want um for our soul growth so big big satin themes of maturity going on um we also might be quite focused on learning to compromise with other people and that's a part of the relational lessons that satin's wanting to teach as well um uh yeah so relationships this is so interesting because Saturn's tra transiting my first house this um, this coming year and crossing my ascendant this year. And relationships where uh, you and your partner, if you're in an existing relationship, where you're not committed to the long term, um, they'll come to an end when Saturn transits the ascendant or the descendant. But if you're in a relationship where it's, you know, it, you are committed, <laughs> you'll make some sort of solid you know, um, union because of Saturn's transit to the ascendant or the descendant, you know, you buy a house together or some people might have children together, somebody might, you know, get married. Like there is a commitment of a high level made from Saturn's transit to the ascendant or descendant for people who are in um, relationships where they're in it for the long term, you know, the, the mature kind of relationships, I guess you'd call that. Um, now, single people who are having this transit of Saturn can get involved with one of the most serious or intense love relationships of their life. Again, it's probably going to be karmic. Um, or sometimes it manifests, I've seen this, um, in people with, uh, you know, an infatuation with an unsuitable partner, somebody, you know, designed to teach you, like we've said, about your relational karma or inadequacies or attitudes that that need to be rectified so if a relationship comes during a Saturn uh, transit remain objective remain grounded my friends and do some mature soul searching um, about the nature of the relationship that you find yourself in from a Saturn transit um, and I will just say with David and myself Saturn Lord of my 12th house was transiting my 12th house when we met and it really indicated a wrapping up of old karma that no longer served me. And I, I gave that illustration before of a, a previous boyfriend who um, I hadn't been in contact with for a number of years but still felt there was an energetic link that ended. Very otherworldly, very 12th house. So maybe some of us who are having... Um, for Aries people who are having sat in trans at the 12th house, you might be finding there's a wrapping up maybe of um, relational things in your life. For some of you, let's say if you had, you're had you an Aries rising and you had your Venus in Pisces or 12th house Lord in Pisces, Moon in Pisces, you might be experiencing that kind of a uh, an experience. As you can see, there's a lot going on. It's hard to, you know, narrow it down to single things because there's so much going on and it could, you know, manifest in different ways for different people. But I'm trying to keep it in a nutshell.
And because of that, I'm going to move on now to Uranus, who's over here, as we already know, down with Jupiter in Taurus. So if Uranus, or um, sorry, if you have Taurus or Scorpio as your rising sign, um, then there's going to be uh, Taurus either in the first house or aspecting the seventh house in some way with that configuration. And in 2024, Uranus is going to move not too far because he doesn't he doesn't travel very far in the course of a year, but he's going to move from, say, 19 degrees. What have I got here? 19 degrees of Taurus to 27 degrees. So just a shorter space there. Um, and this is going to be a helpful year for love for this axis, or if you've got your moon or your sun or seventh house lord there. Um, and it's it's going to be especially important if you have your ascendant or descendant between that 19 to 27 degrees then Uranus will be crossing your ascendant and descendant and that's going to trigger things uh, and there's more potential for manifestation with that. So Uranus's transits to the seventh house uh, or opposing the seventh house tend to bring us more personal freedom, more liberation, more excitement when it comes to love and commitment. Now, um, when we have Uranus moving through the seventh house, if we were Scorpio rising, it would mean that we might meet partners who are Uranian, quite, you know, exciting, interesting. Maybe we meet astrologers and we're attracted to them. All Uranian kind of energy, you know, bohemian people, people who are a bit left of center, genius-like people. These are all Uranian qualities. When you've got Uranus transiting the first house, what it's doing is making you more Uranian so you think about liberation more. You think about, you know, attaining your freedom more. Um, and so you might instigate a divorce because I'm sick of feeling trapped or I'm sick of feeling like I'm not free within myself because of this relationship that I'm in. So Uranus is a bit of a two-edged sword. He's bringing blessing by allowing you to, you know, get become liberated, let's say, or freed. Um, but he's going to, um, you know, maybe bring about certain circumstances that aren't so pleasant to to give you that experience of uh, freedom and, you know, got that monkey off my back kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's a very important transit for liberating us, whether it's in the seventh house or the first house, and shaking up how we relate to other people because we're going to get more authentic now. Either way, no matter which first house, seventh house, particularly it's strong with the the axis, the relationship axis, perhaps not quite so potent um, as that with the um, the moon or the sun or seventh house Lord placement or Venus, particularly strong with the relationship axis, really breaking you free out of relational situations and shaking up how you interact with other people. Um, you also tend to have more detachment with a Uranus transit like this in how you view commitment less you know less or like saturn brings about the i want to commit i want to partner and make it solid uranus is more like i want to be experimented i want to you know I, I want things to be not following the rules so let's have a liberated relationship whatever that might happen to look like for you so that can manifest under a uranus transit um it does tend to alter our relational situations completely so when I got divorced years ago, when Uranus transited through my ascendant Pisces, um, that's what it brought, it brought a divorce. So that that's something that happened. Um, but sometimes like we can meet people, like I said as well, that can also happen. Usually the if you get divorced from a Uranus transit, it will come because the relationship is shaky or you're not being authentic or true to your heart regarding that relationship and so Uranus says hey I demand authenticity so I'm getting rid of anything that's not authentic in your life when it comes to relationships if you're in a happy healthy marriage or committed partnership what Uranus will do it will um, deepen your relational experience you might start doing something experimentative with your partner um, you might both of you get interested in some Uranian theme like studying astrology or esoteric matter together or really interested in quantum physics or something like that together as a couple um you know uranus brings uh, growth of a uranian nature to the relationship in a healthy relationship and if you're single well it can bring in 
sudden unexpected relationships that you didn't see coming that came out of the blue um, with people who will transform your view of the world and it mightn't be long lasting because your um, Uranus doesn't bring long lasting relationships it brings um it brings unexpected ones sometimes it brings long distance relationships relationships where there's a big age gap um, between the two people uh, or lots of on again off again one moment we're going out the next moment we're fighting and it's all over and then back again and you know sort of very erratic energy to relationships so it can be exciting can be liberating can be fun but less likely to be to bring in for those who are looking for it um, something uh, committed for the long term I will just mention when David and I met one of the things that was going on was that my um, uh, my seventh house Lord Mercury and Mars, which is my soul journey planet in the Vedic system, were sitting together on my exactly on my descendant degree the day I found David, and they were both making a trine to transiting Uranus, or Uranus was tr um, trining them. And how did David and I meet? Through the internet, through, I saw his video online and I was like, oh, I really want to meet this, interview this person and chat with him. So it's, um, Uranus could happen like that. You might simply just meet somebody through, uh, you know, the internet or, um, you know, online social media kind of dating sites. Um, Uranus also has a connection to friendship as well. It's the higher octave of Mercury. So you might meet through a friend. So that could also happen as well. I'll just point that out. So that's Uranus. Um, if you, I just want to say, if you have a Uranus aspect forming and this transit's triggering something, um, if you've also got an aspect from Saturn at the same time to something in your chart of relational significance, then it can bring about uh, an exciting, electrifying sort of fireworks kind of relationship that does also last a long time, that is solidified. Saturn can sort of be a blessing in that case because it's giving more concreteness to a, an ex a relationship that begins with a Uranian bang, you know? So if you've got both of those sorts of things happening, then you're in for a great time. Let's look at Neptune. Um, Neptune is at the latter degrees of Pisces for the duration of 2024. He's moving from 25 degrees of Pisces all the way up to the 29th degree of Pisces, not quite out of the woods yet with Pisces, the sign it rules. So this is going to be a helpful year for love for anyone who has um, key planets, relational planets like Venus or your seventh house Lord or your moon or the ascendant or descendant between those degrees, 25 to 29 of Pisces or 25 to 29 of Virgo opposite it as well so um what does a neptunian transit to relational planets bring well neptune is so hard i i don't know if you've encountered difficulties with neptune later but my goodness neptune can be full of contradictions sometimes so let's um let's explore what neptune's all about neptune I no the planet i like the least <laughs> Yes. It, it, it's I, beautiful because i've never felt such deep feelings as during neptune but it's oh it's so good to be out of this sacrificial <laughs> state <laughs> and kind yeah. of with your head type of thing but it, it's beautiful it can be a feeling you've never felt before so profound so like soul meets soul and recognize a soul but there is always especially with the hard aspect something that it's you're yearning, but you can't have it. It's kind of thing. Yep. Unrequited love is is Neptune. Um, I have heard Neptune referred to as the planet of soulmates, but I've also heard Pluto. Um, I'm kind of more inclined to think Pluto is soulmates. Maybe they both have a little something to say on that topic. They're, but they're both, um, we'll talk about Pluto in a second. They're very interesting, that's for sure. So if Neptune by transit is making any of these aspects, as Lard has already said, you could enjoy some super exquisite romance. Neptune is glamour. Neptune is um, high level, you know, romantic feelings, but they can be illusionary. So I'll just caution you about that. Um, you know, what, you, what you're experiencing mightn't be the reality, the truth of the situation. So keep your eyes 
peeled, you know, and um, take everything with a grain of salt lest you be deceived. But in the positive, Neptune can bring these exquisite romances, high rom romantic experiences. You can encounter spiritual people um, or have a very spiritual love that feels driven by the gods, you know, um, or connecting over spiritual matters with someone as well. And there's some of the positive ways Neptune can express. It's um, unless Saturn's involved, um, Neptune doesn't necessarily indicate a long-term commitment being formed. Um, so I keep that in mind again, a bit like Uranus in that way, because again, we might commit for a time, but then the the mist fall, you know, or the, the wool falls from our eyes or the mist disappears and we're like, what was I thinking? What am I doing with that person? You know, um, so it can bring a bit of confusion about why they go down that road. Um, Neptune transits uh, opposite to the, oh, I should show this, shouldn't I? In a, opposing the seventh house or conjuncting the seventh, uh, it's not conjuncting, in the seventh house, um, they can bring a loss of objectivity and clarity about relationships, which is what I've just described. Um, sort of, it, it can generate a more heart centered type relationship uh, instead of a relationship based on the mind or material matters or logic based relationships. It's much more spiritual. But you've got to be careful of, oh, I've fallen in love with this person. I'm going to rescue them. You know, I'm going to be their savior or they're my knight in shining armor. Like, oh, if you, that's the way you're thinking, you know, warning bells need to be going. You know, hear my voice saying, think twice if that's what you're thinking about a relationship that's forming while Neptune is making these particular transits. Now, if in your natal chart, you have a really well aspected Neptune, doesn't have any squares to it, any oppositions to it, um, even, you know, if it's just out there solo without a conjunction two would be probably preferable, then when you have a Neptune transit like this to planets that have to do with relationship, it can bring in, like I said, very spiritualized soulmate types of love. So, but that's only, like I said, if you've got this exquisite like Neptune in your natal chart to begin with might that manifest as a blessing from the higher realms you know and it'll manifest in a way where you don't do anything to make it happen it just comes it just flows into your life not in a shocking unexpected way like Uranus but just in a manner that is um uh, like infiltrating, like fog maybe. Maybe you've been friends with someone at work for years and then suddenly the love is there and it's just consuming you and you see them with these, you know, rose-coloured glasses and it's it's more infiltrating in that way um, and can feel like it's a manifestation of the divine in, in some manner. Um, now, if I should cover the fact that if you have an, a Neptune with difficult natal aspects to it as well in your natal chart, then you've got to be really careful of any relationships that are triggered by a, a transit of Neptune like this. We tend to project our ideals onto someone. We tend to try, as I said, try and rescue them. Um, it can bring unrequited love, as I mentioned earlier, uh, or falling in love with people who are married or unavailable in some way um, that's not healthy. So, um, yeah, if you've got a mixed bag of good and good and negative aspects to um Neptune rather um, then you'll get a mixed result that's kind of how it works so that's um that's kind of Neptune in a nutshell and as for Pluto here in Capricorn Pluto can be very kick-ass when it comes to relationship astrology I'm just going to um yeah I'm just gonna hold my astro wheel so that it doesn't go for a walk um but one of my teachers Jeffrey Wolf Green speaks a lot about the the journey of Pluto and has a whole book on Pluto as a uh, and its relational aspects and and what it can do it is considered as I mentioned a little while ago it, one of the planets that can bring in a soulmate or create a soulmate kind of depth to a relationship and this year 20 or not this year <laughs> 2024 Pluto is going to be transiting from the 29th degree of Capricorn um and yeah and then he's as we know changing signs backwards and forwards over this this key point in the chart really and when Pluto is at one of the latter degrees 
of a sign, he always manifests very harshly. So it's like when he's at 29 degrees of Capricorn, he's like, that's it. I have to bring to a manifestation everything that I began in 2008 when I first moved into Capricorn. And if I haven't done it yet, I'm going to rip the rug out from under you right now to make it happen. So it can be pretty heavy duty kind of experiences while Pluto is at the final degree of Capricorn. And then he's moving only as far as two degrees of Aquarius throughout the course of 2024. So this will be a helpful year for manifesting Plutonian love, if you want that, um, for people with the, the latter degrees of Cancer, Capricorn, or the early degrees of Aquarius, Leo, um, strong in their chart, like their ascendant or descendant on those points, or maybe the moon or Venus or your seventh house Lord, for example. Um, yeah, so it, it's going to be especially important if it's your ascendant or descendant with Pluto crossing it. So when Pluto transits these points, um, it transforms our whole dynamic relating to ourselves and relating to other people, especially with the ascendant descendant. Um, it brings intense and powerful commitments sometimes. Like I said, it feels almost suffocating, like the intensity of emotion you'll feel about a person. Um, in my natal chart, I have Pluto square to Venus. And when I was younger, before I'd learned to master or handle that energy, I felt like consumed to the point where I could hardly breathe sometimes by certain intensities of emotion that I would go through. Um, and it can be like that. You meet someone and they just take your breath away or they make your, your knees go weak and can hardly stand up around them. Those sorts of things are Pluto-like relationships. So if you're single, one thing that can happen is you might meet um, the most passionate love experience of your life. If you're in an unhappy relationship, Pluto again can trigger divorce. Why? Because Pluto um, Pluto doesn't, um, he's a bit like Uranus in that he doesn't tolerate inauthenticity. But with Pluto, it's really about learning to stand in your power. And so if you've lost your power through a, a relationship um, you know, that that's just where you're giving yourself away to somebody constantly in a relationship dynamic. Pluto transit to the ascendant or descendant particularly is saying, that's it. I'm not tolerating this anymore. We're taking our power back. And the more that you can go with the flow of that, the easier it will be with you. The more you fight that occurrence, the more difficult the, the whole experience can, can feel. Um, so unhappy relationships can come to an end because of, of that. Um, it, if your relationship, if you're in a relationship and it's not unhappy, Pluto deepens and intensifies a good relationship. So you, you want to, you're going to want to completely merge and unite with your partner when this, this occurs. Soulmate love is possible with this transit, but it'll be very karmic as well, because, um, like Saturn, Pluto is karmically kick-ass and you'll meet somebody from a past life who you need to sort out your karma with. Um, or like I said, with, when I was talking about Saturn, it'll bring up karmic issues in you, maybe trust issues or um, issues of personal power that need to be addressed and that person stepping into your life to help you unravel those experiences. There can be power struggles with existing loved ones when this um, transit occurs. So yeah, again, um, you'll be transformed by interactions with other people as well as another manifestation here. You might be, if you're single, <clears throat> pardon me, you might be attracted to Plutonian types. And what are they like? Powerful, powerful people, um, transformative people. People are going to change you. Worst case scenario, Pluto rules people like underworld kind of people, quite literally underworld people. So, you know, do you do your double checking on who you're dating um, when you're having this transit <laughs> if you want to keep it above board Pluto's the shadow side you might not want that so yeah um, it, it can bring deep and emotional and passionate love um, better to hang out for that than to end up with some mafia crime boss that you don't want to get involved in maybe maybe you do want that and good for you if that's what you're after okay so they're the outer planets the final thing that I want to talk about in what's happening in 2024 is Venus because Venus is the planet of love and relationships and in our personal chart, um, Venus is, is very powerful. So we're going to look at 
um, powerful for love, I mean. So we're going to look at Venus's transits. Again, keep in mind that I'm going to talk about some of the aspects that she'll be making to these other planets throughout the year that are going to be perhaps triggering something, but only likely to trigger something if it is connecting with something in your natal chart. So if Venus is transiting across your descendant and at the same time making an aspect, a beneficial aspect to Uranus, boom, then it might bring in some kind of a, a relationship. So that's what we're looking at here. Venus's transits in relation to the outer planets particularly is what I'm going to look at. And if it's connecting with something in your natal chart, then there's more chance something might manifest. So when we have a Venus um, interaction by transit with uh, Uranus, for example, um, it can bring sudden infatu infatuations with somebody, exciting relationships. But again, if you want it to last the long term, then you need the support of Saturn in that um, configuration. Otherwise, the relationship might be very short lived. Um, but it'll shake you out of a rut and make your life very exciting for a time. If Venus aspects Neptune, and I'm going to give you some dates that these things and, and degrees, these might be taking place. But if Venus aspects Neptune, then um, you're going to have the things I spoke about with Neptune effects, um, you know, potentially positive, especially if the Venus aspect is a trine. Um, it could be things like romantic love, being swept off your feet, um, you know, seeing that person as, you know, the love of your life, feeling like unconditional love for that person might be what you're experiencing with Neptune, beautiful fairy tale like kind of relationships. And Pluto, if Venus is aspecting in a positive way, I'm only going to talk about the positive here. Let's leave the negative alone. If Pluto is aspecting, um, Sorry, if Venus is aspecting Pluto and triggering something of significance like your ascendant in your natal chart, then it brings positive relationships that are deep, intense, transformative, and that feel like a soulmate karmic connection. So what's Venus doing this year? And I'm going to, if you want to grab a pen and paper or make a note on your iPad or something, I'm going to give you the dates and I'm going to give you the degrees that these aspects are forming. First one is on the 28th of January, 2024, Venus will trine Jupiter. And this is when Jupiter is uh, in, in at six degrees of Taurus and Venus will be at six degrees of Capricorn. So if you have anything there, then that's a potential manifestation of some, uh, with Jupiter involved, beneficial relationship um, that brings joy and beauty. The things I've described as being uh, Jupiterian uh, a little earlier in this video. Then on the 8th of the 2nd, 8th of February, 2024, um, we've got Venus making a trine to Uranus. And this will be uh, from 19 degrees Capricorn, Venus, to 19 degrees Taurus for Uranus's position. And then something very powerful is happening um, on uh, the 22nd of February. And this is the conjunction of Venus and Mars. Now, I haven't spoken much about Mars here we're mostly looking at the triggers brought about by the outer planets and by Venus, planet goddess of love. But Venus and Mars were lovers in the old mythologies um, and they are that in the sky as well. And their conjunction can bring about and manifest certain relational things. Now, um, it is a powerful connection that's very unique and very interesting. Um, the Venus... Where shall I begin with this? The Venus cycle um, for this one began back in 2021. So, um, okay, I'll start by talking about what you can expect to get from this and then I'll talk about how this cycle is playing out. So sexual tension can arise. Oh, you see that guy at work and oh, he's so hot and oh, heart's fluttering and that sexual tension is just there, bang, bang, bang. Um, that's increased under this interaction. Physical attraction, definitely on the cards. You know, you see that hot chick walking down the street and you're like, you know, we used to have an ad for a deodorant where a man would just rush up and give a woman flowers. Well, maybe that's a Mars Venus type interaction, you know, um, quite exciting and physical attraction, all that sort of thing. Um, healthy relationships can flourish under Mars Venus coming together like this. But um, if things are a bit frayed and a bit fractious, this can 
cause arguments because Mars is a bit blustery and Venus is refined and elegant. And so if, if things are a bit already a bit fractious, then Mars and Venus coming together can be a bit explosive. Um, so I just I just want to let you know how that energy might manifest generally for us on the 22nd of the second. Now, the last time that these two got together in the sky was actually back in February, March 2022. And this conjunction was odd and it was odd at the time because the masculine mars was the one who caught venus venus was retrograding so mars venus was going backwards and mars came up behind her and they made a conjunction and that's rare because usually it's venus the faster planet that catches mars first and comes up behind mars and they make a conjunction but this conjunction back in february march 2022 was very very rare another thing that was very unusual about this conjunction back in 2022 that occurred very early in 2022 was that it had only been seven months since their previous conjunction their previous conjunction occurred in sort of july august 2021 was which is very interesting to me because that's the time when i met david so they met and again it was your normal venus mars conjunction at that time venus caught mars and then she traveled on and then did a retrograde and came back and they made a conjunction in only seven months later in early 2022 so usually venus mars conjunctions occur at 24 month intervals um, from one another every 24 months which is what's happening now it's 24 months since their last conjunction but keep in mind, we are in this um, very unusual Mars-Venus cycle that began with a conjunction where Mars caught Venus. Very odd. And so it's it's fascinating to me that, um, that, that at this time, especially, I must say, between that that seven-month period between July 2021 and um, March 2022, we saw a lot of divorces, people finding their soulmates, twin flames, loves that only come once in a lifetime, people leaving marriages. I, I had so many readings at that time for people whose relationships were falling apart. And it wasn't just because of the whole COVID situation on the planet. It was also this Mars-Venus cycle thing. So that seven-month period was very pivotal for sort of breaking down things in, uh, that weren't working. And then from February, March 2022 through to now, we've been in this different cycle of Venus catching Mars that will conclude, as I said, on the 22nd of February. So what's been established at this time during this particular transit uh, uh, between their, their, this particular cycle, I should say, between their conjunctions is a very unusual thing very different kind of energy because mars was the conjunctor last time and then we go back to the venus um so it's unique it's rare it's once in a lifetime what has been going on i just want to ask everybody out there watching this video what's been going in, on in your love life since this unusual union of venus and mars occurred back in 2022 and then wrapping up for us in 2024 in february fascinating i just love looking at cycles i love seeing how they differ at times and what they bring about with their different behaviors and and little unique twists and turns so just thought i'd mention that one moving on on the 3rd of april 2024 venus will conjunct neptune at 27 degrees of pisces if you've got something there it's likely to trigger one of those neptunian type relationships or Neptune energies in an existing relationship. On the 17th of April, just checking my dates and notes here, forgive me for looking down from the camera. 17th of April, Venus will conjunct the North Node at 15 degrees of Taurus. North Node is our destiny point, And so it can manifest a relational destiny of some sort, whether that's a connection um, with somebody new, whether it's a you know letting go of an old relationship to make space for the new, um, something to do with our purpose and destiny here on uh, as a soul incarnated on the planet can manifest regarding Venus themes, 15 degrees of Taurus on that day. 28th of April, Venus will go invisible 
well, for some people on the planet. It really depends, like the Earth's a ball. I'm not a flat earther. Um, and it depends whereabouts on the planet you you are, whether you can see Venus or not. But generally speaking, we allow 10 degrees from the sun to indicate Venus going invisible. So she kind of loses her, it's considered that she loses her beneficial powers when she goes in invisible and is caught in the glare of the sun. Um, so it might not be such a beneficial time for relationship from that point on 28th of April and that's going to last through to the 12th of July when she will again be 20, uh, 10 degrees from the sun but emerging from under the sun's rays and become visible um, but again that depends whereabouts you are located on the planet and we're using visible astrology here um, not just the map you've got to go out and stand there and look can I see Venus um, you know, when the sun sets or when the sun rises at any given point. So very locationally dependent. Don't want to labor that point. On the 18th of May next year, Venus will conjunct Uranus at 23 degrees of Taurus. If you've got anything there, something could happen relationally that's exciting and liberating all the Uranian things. On the uh, 23rd of May, Venus will make a conjunction with Jupiter at 29 degrees down here of Taurus. Again, the Jupiterian energy comes in, expansion, love, abundance, all the, the beautiful feelings of love can manifest at that time. Conjunctions of Jupiter and Venus are very, very lovely. Um, the 25th of May, so we're getting boom, 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 <laughs> a few different energies all at once at the end of May. Pluto is going to be in trine to Venus, Pluto over here. And Venus will be over here um, in Taurus. So, um, sorry, Pluto will be at the first degree of Gemini, uh, sorry, Aquarius. And Venus will be at the first degree of Gemini when that occurs. So if you've got anything around the first degree of Gemini or Aquarius, there's an interaction there that could bring about a Plutonian type love experience or relational experience for you. Um, okay, on what have I got written here? The 4th of June there is a combust conjunction with the sun. Now, people get very mixed up about what is Kazemi and what is a combust planet. But this time, Venus is combust. So it's not giving any favours to relationship. Keep that in mind. It could mean difficulties in an existing relationship or you might have some disagreements or, you know, um, if you're in a Uranian-type relationship, you might have one of your squabbles that, you know, you call it all off again and that sort of thing so keep that in mind venus energy is kind of difficult when it's at that exact combustion with the sun um so on the 22nd of june venus um will be in that that zone with the the sun but also the full moon is forming a, as well so um, venus is with the sun and the moon is exactly opposite forming a full moon at one degree of cancer capricorn axis so it's not hugely manifesting when the when venus is invisible but the fact she's involved in that particular full moon does lend it a relational tone so something's going to happen relationally as a result of that particular full moon coming up in the year ahead third of july still invisible um, but she's making a trine to Saturn in Cancer and um, Saturn's in Pisces rather Venus is in Cancer at that time so that can you know if, if you've got other triggers happening at the same time in your chart it's nice that Venus is in a trine even if she is invisible with Saturn that can bring some longevity to any relational um, experiences that unfold at that time for better or worse I might add um, on the 11th of July, Venus will be trying Neptune and Neptune is at 29 degrees of Pisces. Venus will be 29 degrees of Cancer. On the 27th of August, Venus will be trying to Uranus at 27 degrees um, of Taurus and Venus will be at 27 degrees of Virgo. Getting to the end of the list, there's so many things Venus is up to next year, as always. Venus will be um, trining Saturn again on the 14th at 14 degrees of uh, Scorpio, and, Ven and Saturn will be at 14 degrees of Pisces. This is on the 5th of October. Um, also on the 5th of October, she'll be making. Ah, what have I got there? That's a wrong date. Okay. The 4th of December, Venus is going to be trining Uranus at 24 degrees of Taurus. She'll be at 24 degrees of Capricorn. On the 7th of December, 2024, Venus will conjunct Pluto at zero degrees of Aquarius, bringing about 
Plutonian relationship themes in our lives. And finally, we're at the end of the list, 20th, um, 20th of uh, December, Venus will trine Jupiter. Beautiful way to end the year with Jupiter, Venus, love in a trine. 14 degrees um, of Aquarius is where Venus will be and Jupiter will be at 14 degrees thereabouts of Gemini. So we'll get a, a nice little blast at the end of the year of Venus, Jupiter, love and joy, which could really wrap things up nicely. But that's my very brief, <laughs> if you want to call it brief, lowdown for love. There's just so much going on. It's very hard to condense it all. But um, hopefully that's given people, most signs are going to have something active in their charts in the year ahead, um, either through a, a transit or opposition. So hang on to your hats, everybody. It could be quite an interesting year for love. Just, just a last thing, Lada, the fact that we have all these big outer planets, you know, in different signs, sometimes you'll get them all bunched up in a similar area of the chart, but they're all spread out, Gemini, Taurus, two in Pisces, and then Pluto moving between Capricorn and Aquarius brings more potential for everyone to experience some something happening in love um, because a lot of the outer planets are involved in the triggers for relational change in our lives more so than than the inner planets most of the time so have a great year of love everybody in 2024 thank you so much Ksenia I'm looking forward to meet the mafia guy now <laughs> <With you so much. laughs> is well, that you is it <laughs> I know <laughs> Oh, something's well, gonna change. I don't know what will change. Um, I, that don't want deep, I don't want deep earth shattering love, please. I had mine this year. Yeah. What was what did I say was triggering that? Pluto, Pluto transit. So oh yes, moving is your ascendant up here yeah. on in the early degrees of, of Aquarius. Yes. We'll see. I was yeah. thinking of making some big changes together. So let's... well, maybe you might be. I mean, it mightn't be relational. It could be that you'll be collaborating on a business partnership with somebody. Oh, like like uh, something that requires a lot of willpower that we need to do together, like uh, physical exercise and like, but it's so hard. It's, it's really, really hard to get into that. <laughs> I think because Pluto is incredible willpower as well. So I'm hoping <laughs> we That's can. what you need. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Pluto transits transform your life like nothing else does. So I I would consider that to be, I, I find it quite exciting. I, my solar return chart this year has Pluto on the ascendant. I'm intrigued. I'm like, what's this, go what's this all about? You know, I, I, um, I went through, I mean, and you've probably been through it too, a Pluto square transit ladder um pluto squaring itself nothing shook my life up more than that transit it was phenomenal and i feel like when you've gone through that you can handle anything <laughs> that pluto throws at you from from then on because um that one's a doozy you've been through that transit haven't you yes square the sun the mars and venus within one or two years old it's uh it was psychological deep. It was an internal battle a bit. <laughs> so now I'm like on the ascendant. I I felt I was dying at moments with Pluto square sun. Like there was some health problem that was no one could figure out. And, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. oh no. <laughs> as long as we're healthy, everything else is like... yeah wish everyone to experience love definitely uh in different shapes sometimes love is not just you know passion sex and so on love can be experiencing uh love to a friend and but yeah i'm intrigued to see <laughs> i'll tell you if i survive well, I, here i remember you saying once upon a time Lada, that um in early i think you were talking about karmic relationships with um, uh, the south node and the north node at the time and you were saying you know yeah um, early, relationships early in life are very can be very exciting and thrilling because it's new and whatever and relationships when you're older are more comfortable like an old slipper <laughs> but I would use a, an analogy of um, coming home David and I often say to each other you know there's this feeling of just 
ah, oh, you know, belonging and comfort and and things being right, you know. Um, oh, which, I can see that's the giddiness there as well. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> but it is like that too. It just feels comfortable, you know, and it's beautiful. Yeah, it's really beautiful. <laughs> but we um, met, I met my husband during Uranus transit. Uranus on my sun and Venus and Mars because they're like on top of each other, the three of them, and Uranus passed. And it was so sudden. Um, In two months, I moved into a, to a, to an, another continent with him and I was pregnant. And he yeah. had Venus on his seventh house cusp exactly there. So right. it lasted. by transit, yeah, by transit, both of us were activated by your. It was so giddy. Uranus is like butterflies. Your stomach is like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and it happened so fast. And I was like, because knowing astrology, you always read like when Uranus triggers, it might not be long lasting. But for me, it was like I needed this really impulsive energy of Uranus to shake off the past. So I can shake off a continent, the previous marriage and everything. So but I was like, I don't care. Astrologer. You're an astrologer. So you channel that more positive expression of Uranus anyway. So less likely to be that shadow side of erratic and, you know, um, things not lasting and that sort of thing. Well, if so, you change your life a lot, that's what the Uranian relationships appear. So you can take out of a rut. And mm. if you do it, it might stay, it might, you know. Uh, yeah. Who knows? And, and I've noticed usually how relationships start, that's how they end. There's something in uh -huh. a relationship <laughs> starts suddenly, it can end suddenly. Or for relationships, uh, it, it there is something interesting sometimes that I notice. Or, or I it, just, I... If it ends at all, you know. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. Well, well, ending it, I, you know, it does, I don't think it's necessarily bad. Like that Jupiter, when Jupiter transits, I've seen so many charts where Jupiter has been transiting the descendant and the, and the relationships ended, but it's been beneficial yeah. for both parties, you know, because they were not happy or things weren't. Just oh, things yeah, weren't like freedom. Jupiter is also to be moksha, you know, liberated, to be relieved. So, yeah. Oh. It's it's endlessly fascinating. Relationship astrology ah. is forever intriguing and and very complex and takes a lot of time to research a lot of the time as well <laughs> because there's so many factors between two people interacting. And um, only if you've been suffering a long time in relationships are you willing to put the time to do the research. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. That is so true, yeah. <laughs> We can laugh uh, now. <laughs> We're laughing last, but it was it so wasn't hard. funny before. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you but, all get to have a laugh. All of us that are watching us, even if your heart's been broken a hundred times and you, or you've broken a hundred times someone's heart, there is, you know, if your heart stays open and trusting and loving, it will come. <laughs> yes, and don't don't give up, you know. I there's a lot of bitterness um that you see more and more often on social media and things like that and it, and it's really sad because people are hurting you know um but um the more you can work on healing your heart if you have been hurt the more you're preparing the soil for the new seed that's going to be sown in the future so don't give up keep doing the work and um believe in miracles because they they can happen to people <laughs> um <laughs> What you said we people. did, we didn't even look for relationships. We just did the things that make us happy. We started doing the things. Yeah. That, that's that's working on it. That's actually find the thing that yeah. makes you happy and do it. That's working on it, and then it will come. <laughs> that's so true. That that's that's it. I mean, you were on a holiday, talking about <laughs> doing things that make you happy. <laughs> I had given up looking for someone. I was married. Sorry. I was not happily married. I had given up, like I was like, mm, I'm married, I'm not in love, but okay, we're best friends, let's, <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'm just going for fun, and it happens then. <laughs> anyway. That is wonderful, and yeah, and Thank you so you've much. got a beautiful man in Matt too, he's lovely. <laughs> Thanks God, <laughs> same to you, Senia, yeah. and I'll put links guys below for uh, Ksenia's courses, they're fantastic.
and I, I think there is a discount or something I'll check again with you we could do a package uh, deal that'd be great <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you so much for your insight and I will see you again very soon hopefully yes thank you Lara thank you everybody and happy 2024 happy 2024 bye bye